I'm Scott Voorhees. You've heard about Trump and DeSantis heading across Iowa. Soon it's going to be Chris Christie and I guess Vice President Pence is going to be swinging back and forth across the state as well. But uh, there's there's always another option beyond the Republicans and Democrats. And on your ballot a couple of years ago, there was a guy named Spike on there. Well, he's in the studio. You're going to meet Spike Cohen. Members of the House of Representatives like Nebraska 2nd District Congressman Don Bacon say, well, the Biden budget projects $19 trillion more deficits in the coming decades. So uh, we really held some feet to the fire. We cut $1.5 trillion in spending over the next 10 years. And this is a great deal for the American people. I'm like, it sounds like we're still going $17.5 trillion more in debt on top of the 32 we're already at. How is this a great deal? Let's start off our conversation here with Spike Cohen on that note. Spike, thank you very much for joining us here on News Radio 1110 KFAB. Welcome. I'm happy to be here, Scott. Thanks for having me on, man. You're not currently a candidate for office. I'm not. I've not made a decision yet, but a decision will be forthcoming. All right. You want to make any news announcements <laughs> here today? Not not quite, yeah. but uh, I, I, do, I will tell you this, uh, whether I run or not, the American people clearly need better options. Spike Cohen was the vice presidential uh, candidate on the Libertarian ticket for president, 2020, with was it Joe Jorgensen, Joe Jorgensen was the yeah. Libertarian mm-hmm. presidential candidate. Uh, I don't see her running again at this point. But. Uh, you'd have to ask her, but okay. I probably don't see it either. Uh, have you and Joe Jorgensen done a Trump-Pence split? You guys don't talk anymore or what? (laughs) Uh, Joe Jorgensen, I'll leave it at this. The way that the Libertarian Party picks candidates is different. Uh, It's the delegates who pick the vice presidential candidate. Uh, She asked them to pick someone else. They picked me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, discord already. (laughs) Right Uh, from the beginning. Well, the way that Libertarian Party does everything is a little bit different. But we can talk more about that. But I think you're the perfect person to address this uh, This. Uh, we, we've headed off, crashing into the debt ceiling. We've saved the American taxpayers a small amount of money in the mm. years to come here. Your response to this this big budget deal. Yes, imagine uh, being able to sit down with your significant other and saying, honey, uh, we've run up our uh, credit limits to the hilt. Uh, and so uh, I propose that we unilaterally increase our uh, debt limit and uh, make our neighbors' kids who haven't been born pay for it. That's mm-hmm. the debt ceiling debate in, in, encapsulated. And it is wild to watch the so-called fiscal conservatives in Congress say, instead of running up an additional almost $20 trillion in debt, we're going to knock it down to about 18 or so and, uh, you know, mission accomplished. Yeah. And, and what they're saying is the $31 trillion debt is going to be at least about Fifty trillion dollars over the next few years. That's not a victory. That's that's more of what got us here. The American people hear all of that. They understand all of that. Yep. They don't care. They should because well, of course why, they it's, should. It's why they we don't. Our rampant inflation. Yeah. Because for their entire voting lives, they've always heard, "Oh, our nation's too far in debt. We're spending more money. We're taking it." Yep. And then people, you know, maybe maybe there have been people over the last twenty to thirty years that said, "Yeah, I'm really serious about all of this nation's debt." And they hear oh, it's going to be a big crisis, and then nothing ends up happening. Yep. The debt doubles, triples. You know, yeah, in yeah. some cases, over the Obama administration during one president's two terms in office and they don't see any big disruption to their lives they don't see where it's really affected them any and then they hear like all right this is just political posturing why should they care about our nation's debt they actually do see it but they don't realize what it is the reason we have rampant and out of control inflation and the cost of living spiraling out of control is precisely because the federal reserve has to create federal reserve notes to lend to the treasury in order to be able to cover this debt you are paying for this. It is a. It is the most uh, uh, insidious tax is inflation because you're paying for it. You're just paying for it after the fact by the, the fact that your money is worth less because they're printing out more notes to chase the same number of goods and services, which inherently drives up the cost of everything. So uh, every time you go to, whether you're going to the grocery store or you're buying a home or anything else that you're doing, when you see that price going up and up and up, that is a direct reflection of the debate that we're seeing right now over the debt. It needs to go down. So let's say in my neighborhood my lawn looks absolutely terrible a 
it looks great. But let's just say for sake of this example, my lawn <laughs> yes. looks really, really awful. Yes. Just like, you know, patchy grass over here, a lot of dead spots over here, mm -hmm. weeds all over the place. But I look up and down my street and I see, you know, like no lawn at all or yep. nothing yep. but dandelions. And I look across the neighborhood and go, well, compared to everyone else, you know, my lawn looks pretty darn good. Oh, yeah. That's where America is in terms of our economy with the rest of the world. That we have a long history of patting ourselves on the back and saying, well, at least we aren't like those communist dictatorships and socialist democracies yet. And, and so as we progressively get worse and as things progressively worsen, we continue to look to places that are worse and say, well, at least we aren't as bad off as them. And that's true. But and hear me out. How about we just don't get worse? We, we know what we need to do. We need to cut spending. We need to reduce the debt or, or at the very least not add to it and allow it to be paid down over time. And that would lead to less inflation. That would lead to less of the, uh, the, 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 the problems that we're seeing in Congress and everything else uh, as a direct result of that. And, and or we can continue to go down this path. And it's not a good one. And one thing to keep in mind, we fought a revolution over taxation without representation. Every time they increase the debt, they are running up debt, which is taxation with interest in the names of people who haven't even been conceived or born yet. If that's not taxation without representation, I don't know what is. I've talked to libertarian candidates for a variety of offices, including uh, presidential contenders over the years, and every single time I get... And an inbox full of people that say, man, everything that this candidate is saying is so great, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but but usually, usually the but is, but I don't think they can win, so I'm not going to vote for them. Yeah, self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, the one thing that I will say is this. If I'm voting for who I think is going to win, that's not me voting for my values. That's me doing horse betting. And at this point, I think that this election and, and the situation we are in is far too important for, for us to throw our vote away for the same two parties and candidates who put us in this mess. We are looking at almost certainly Trump versus Biden. Biden has run up a massive amount of debt in just the couple of years he's been in office. Donald Trump has the single term record for the most debt run up. He ran up 7.8 trillion dollars in debt less than a trillion dollars short of what it took obama to run up in two terms where and was that before the pandemic and the push for vaccines and all of that? he was outpacing obama before that but not obviously not nearly as much but frankly part of that's his fault too he was the yeah. one standing up there with yeah. anthony fauci saying 15 days to slow the spread he tweeted and complained about what fauci and the cdc were guiding the states into but he didn't curtail his power he signed off on every budget that increased his power and his funding uh you know i mean if if it's one thing to say that something's bad it's it's another thing to actually do your job and put an end to it he didn't investigate the origins of covid uh you know if, if we thought donald trump was going to drain the swamp what a great time for him to do it when it was filling up with toxic ooze and instead he let it happen talking here with spike cohen the 2020 vice presidential candidate for the libertarian party let me turn this around on you then sure really easy for the libertarians to stand there on the sidelines and look at the two parties playing the game in front oh, of them absolutely. going oh you guys both suck <laughs> and it's never gonna get any better and then finally someone all right if you want to come in here and you play you want to be quarterback for a little bit and they're mm -hmm. like ah, and i'm not gonna come join your party i'm not gonna come alongside this already established party full of candidates that may actually win in an election mm. and work on, with you to make things better. We're just going to stand here on the sidelines and heckle. Well, I think it depends on the race you're running on, obviously. Uh, libertarians have won hundreds of races. They're usually at the local and regional level. Um, but we don't just sit on the sidelines. If we got elected, we have a game plan for what to do. If a libertarian is in the White House, the first thing they do is they look through the decades of bad executive orders and anything that is unconstitutional that doesn't line up with the constitutional limitations set forth uh, or isn't explicitly there to protect lives, rights, and property, it goes away. And when people see the immediate positive effects of them being more free and not being as imposed upon – uh, the president can then use that political goodwill, take it all the way to the st steps of Congress and say, OK, let's do more at the legislative level. Of course, that means getting libertarians elected at the legislative level of w as well. But we're not just sitting on the sidelines. We have a plan. We know what needs to be done. And frankly, it's all common sense stuff the, the people that are in charge are the fringe. They're the ones saying, let's run up tens of trillions of dollars in debt to fund your own subjugation. They're the ones saying, let's keep kicking the can down the road as things continue to worsen around us. That is as fringe as it gets. So why aren't you the vice president of the United States then? Well, because we didn't get elected. <laughs> right. why, why don't 
more candidates get elected with that. Obviously, we talked about people saying, love your message. I don't think you can win. I'm not going to vote for you. I mean, there's got to be more than that, though. Why isn't that message breaking through then? Like, well, if you think that we have the right message, send other people and the Republicans and Democrats a message by getting us more and more votes. Maybe we can pull this off. Well, and that is our message. And there's a variety of reasons why we haven't gotten elected at higher levels. I mean, we could talk about corporate media blackouts that we get. We could talk about the fact that we aren't even included in polling uh, and that that uh, inclusion in polling is necessary to be allowed in the debates, but they don't actually have to include us. We could talk about the fact that we have to spend millions of dollars just to get ballot access that Republicans and Democrats get automatically. But honestly, this being single biggest challenge that we face is that the average American believes that you have to either vote Republican or Democrat. You have to pick the so-called lesser evil. That that mindset, which is reinforced by all the other stuff, but that mindset's the single biggest thing. But what I tell people is if you are voting each election cycle for how much evil you want, you're just going to get progressively more evil. And I don't – this isn't a hypothetical thing. We're watching this play out. Do you want you know, uh, $20 trillion in new debt or only $18.5 trillion in new debt? The only way we're ever going to fix this is, is to say, no, we're not going to do this anymore. Even if my candidate doesn't win, I know that if either the Republican or Democrat wins, I've already lost. So but I'm going to vote to got, win for a change. You've got a conservative voter saying, I really love to vote for the libertarian candidate in this race, but I'm afraid – it's going to split the vote between the Republican and the Libertarian and hand every election to a Democrat. And I don't think the Republicans or Libertarians want that to happen. Well, I, I certainly don't want Democrats to get elected. But we're talking, again, in this situation, the difference between a $20 trillion debt and an $18.5 trillion dollar debt. The last time we had a Republican in the White House, he, re he still has the single term uh, debt, uh, new debt record. And I mean, so we could look at this on a, on a variety of different issues. There isn't enough of a difference between Republicans and Democrats in actual policy, not words, but in actual policy for me to say that I'm worried about so-called splitting the vote. And, and frankly, we could turn that around. If uh, the Republicans didn't take so many votes from the Libertarians, we could get elected. That's true. <laughs> uh, Republicans have a better track record of winning nationwide yeah. elections and Senate seats and so forth. Why not? then glom on to the Republican Party and make them stronger. There are libertarians like that are doing that. Yeah. And I certainly, I don't, I have, we all have, there are many different paths to get what we want. And if, if someone's best path because of their connections or their influence within the party is to try to make the Republican Party, or for that matter, the Democrat Party, as libertarian as they can, then Godspeed. We have seen the limitations of that, though. I mean, Ron Paul was building a, a huge movement, and they literally locked people in closets to stop them from voting for him at the convention. So, I mean, there there is a a wall that you will hit at some point that, that before you can go any further. But absolutely, if you have connections within the Republican Party, you want to help make it more libertarian, Godspeed. I'll certainly cheer you on. Someone was locked in a closet? Yes, at least one person during the convention well, in Tell me that story. Uh, that's pretty much the story, that one of the Ron Paul delegates got locked in a closet in, did, uh, like, in, at the convention. Did they do it to themselves? No, no, no. no <laughs> was locked in a closet, which is so, technically someone, kidnapping. Someone yep. picked up a uh, what a delegate uh, a speaker at, at so, least one of them and and, and put, put them in, them in a didn't closet want, even though there weren't enough Ron Paul delegates to even stop the nomination of Mitt Romney they didn't want a single non Mitt Romney vote there is a hard wall if you try to change either of the major parties do you think the Ron Paul wave that got started in 2012 is that the well maybe a little bit before oh, wait, that yeah, but oh, it wait, got in stronger yeah. in 12. Do you think that led to Trump in 2016? No, I think that the status quo led to Trump in 2016. Uh, uh, you didn't see Trump as a groundbreaking difference maker as a candidate. Donald Trump was the American people going, screw it, let's try that. <laughs> Hold my beer Hillary and watch Clinton this. or whatever's behind yeah. this secret door. Yeah. We have no idea what's about to happen, but it won't be Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Okay, we choose that. Mm -hmm. I get. I didn't vote for him, mm -hmm. uh, but I certainly understand the inclination of going, that's nah, script. You know what? Mm -hmm. If it's Hillary Clinton or this guy, I'll go with this guy. Yeah. That, that made perfect sense to me. I, I understood that vote. So what changed for 2020? In 2020, we saw the actual what was behind that door. More of the same, but with the bluster of pretending that he wasn't more of the same. Uh, he was complaining about Anthony Fauci and the COVID regimes and the lockdowns and everything else. But when every single budget or omnibus that got put in front of him that increased Anthony Fauci's funding, increased his authority, and did absolutely nothing to hold him accountable, he signed off on it while simultaneously tweeting about how terrible it was. You don't feel like the election was rigged and stolen and some of these allegations? Every election is rigged. Oh. Every single election right. is rigged. Vance Thompson vision.
half price LASIK, and I don't mean like from someone that you know is only going to do such a an awful job that you like. I'm not even going to pay half price for that. Now, this is quality full price LASIK at half price. And 2020 vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party, Spike Cohen, is in the studio with us. I haven't even asked you what the heck you're doing in Omaha Council Bluffs, but we'll we'll get to that as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but a moment ago, Spike, you said all elections are rigged. All elections are stolen. Yes. Please explain and sell us some pillows in the process. <laughs> Actually, I have a great thing I'd like to tell you about LASIK after after this. But um, Why don't you go ahead and take care of that yeah, now? So we'll LASIK forget. is a perfect yeah. example of how the free market can <laughs> fix anything. Yes. Okay, so you look at LASIK surgery. Compare it to 20 years ago. The price is a fraction of what it was, and uh, the quality has increased exponentially. Yes. Uh, the the, the uh, customer uh, approval of it has gone through the roof during that time. At that same 20-year period, uh, the cost of health Healthcare has what quintupled, and uh, and and customer uh, approval or satisfaction has gone down. The difference is in LASIK, there is very little government regulation, taxation, or subsidization. Whereas in almost every other aspect of healthcare, there is. You literally just get the government out of anything, and it immediately gets better because now it's individuals voluntarily making choices, and now you as the consumer are king instead of some bureaucrat or regulator. I love that example. <laughs> now, what's wrong with our elections? I'm going to give you one example of this. So in Tennessee, if you want to run for office uh, as a Republican or a Demo Democrat, you have to get 25 signatures. And that makes sense because they don't want to have a phone book of every person who says, yeah, I'm going to run for president. That yeah. makes sense. They want to show there's a little bit of skin in the game. You get 25 people. If you want to run as anything other than a Republican or Democrat, you have to get 50,000 signatures. And it's actually you have to get 100,000 signatures, even if you're running in a race that doesn't even have 100,000 people voting in it because you're going to get put in front of a judge that's been appointed by a Republican or a Democrat, and they're going to do everything they can to remove and validate as many of those signatures as possible. That's just one example in all 50 states of just how much we have to fight. Anyone who isn't running as a Republican has to fight to just even get on the ballot in the first place. And at every single step, from the ballot to uh, media access to debate access and every step in between, while simultaneously Simultaneously, Republicans and Democrats are getting hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer funding to directly fund their campaigns. The system's rigged from the beginning. There's a reason why it's almost always a Republican or a Democrat that wins. It's because they've all but legislated it that way. The system is absolutely rigged, and the, and the status quo, the powers that be, absolutely decide who's in charge. Run as a Republican because the voters I hear from agree with everything you're saying. Now, once— some of these candidates get in there and they're all singing your tune. Then they get in there and then you got the establishment and oh, yeah. you got all of that uh, mechanism that starts going and they start making votes. People who voted for them go, now, hey, wait a second. You're not the guy that was going to hold feet to the fire and all that stuff. <laughs> so run as a Republican, reform that party uh, and 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 move forward and make America great uh, once more. That's greater right. than I, I it ever was. Make more great once more. I didn't yeah. want to take his uh, tagline. Yeah, I, I say make it greater than yeah. it's ever been. Yeah. Uh, like I said, if someone wants to run as a Republican, I certainly don't begrudge them that. I understand the the differences in the in the uh, uh, likelihood of you getting elected. And frankly, if someone has those similar connections as a Democrat and is more liberty oriented and wants to do it that way, that's perfectly fine. There is a hard wall you are going to hit precisely because those parties are really just a good cop, bad cop routine for an oligarchy that truly runs the system. They are the figureheads that are put in place who are doing the bidding of the the, the Black Rocks and the WEFs and, and, and all the various people that are running the actual show. And so when you are looking at it that way, it makes sense that there's only so much you're going to be able to do within that system because that system is designed to keep, maintain, and grow the status quo. Um, the only way we're going to stop that is by working outside of that system long term. What are you doing in Omaha Council Bluffs, by the way? I am doing a really awesome event tomorrow and Saturday called Liberty Fest. It's in Garland. Uh, if you go to SpikeCohen.com, you can see all the information on how to register. Uh, but we are doing tomorrow, we're doing a machine gun shoot. Uh, then Saturday morning, we're doing another machine gun shoot. So we're doing not one, but two machine gun Explain shoots. Explain the machine gun shoot. We are shooting machine guns. Like, <laughs> it's, it's as like simple as can be. I get to shoot a machine gun. Anyone shoot show a machine up, gun. Yeah. bring the kids and grandma, and everyone can start firing off rounds? I'm or? not sure if children are going to be allowed to shoot the machine guns. I'll leave that up to the uh, the event organizers. I certainly will be doing it. We got. Can I shoot a machine gun? <laughs> I want to do it shirtless with the uh, you know the X's. The what the uh, what do they call the bandoleros of of uh, bullets oh, across bullet, yes. of my chest 
And I want to do it like from the hip, just moving back and forth, Stallone style, like Rambo. Uh, I think as long as you're yes. keeping with the rules okay. of, uh, of of range safety uh, and bring your own bandoleros, Sweet. you I, should be able to, to gotta accomplish get, that. Got to get my headband. All right, this is great. So we're so we're shooting machine guns, and we're also having we have uh, some state legislators are coming. I think uh, four or five state legislators, Nebraska legislators, are coming to speak. Uh, we have some Libertarian Party people coming to speak. Uh, I'm one of the speakers. Uh, we got some great freedom lovers from all over Nebraska and all over the country coming to converge uh, for a fun day of food, fun, hanging out, and uh, and shooting machine guns. You go to SpikeCohen.com. You are the power. Yes. Is that specifically to, about you? Or is that about me? No, we, that's about you. We no, are I'm po- Spike yeah. Cohen. You yeah. are the power. I, I thought maybe, like, you were the power. <laughs> but you are, too, then, if I am. No, I. so it's a Venn, there's a very simple Venn diagram, a very small circle that yeah. says Spike Cohen, and then a much larger one that says the power. Yeah. Uh, the power to do what, Spike? So You Are the Power is actually the name of my nonprofit, and what we do is we find people that are in need of help because they have been uh, abused or neglected by their local governments. We help organize our membership in their communities to get them the help that they need, and we use that as a, as a moment to show people that you have the power to fix this. If we work together, we can fix these things, and we don't need a bunch of politicians and, and bureaucrats and, and cronies to, to run the show for us. All right, so you go to SpikeCohen.com, click on Events. And then you get the details about this event coming up on Saturday in the thriving metropolis of Garland. They got to get you out in the country if you're going to be firing off machine guns. Yeah, you Uh, can't do that amongst the skyscrapers. uh, Uh, Well, it's actually not real close to the town of Garland. It's actually just outside of Garland. So kind of right between Lincoln and Seward, uh, you'll find uh, Garland. Liberty Fest 2023 featuring Spike Cohen coming up this Saturday at 11 o'clock. This is... Uh, a fundraiser? Is this uh, just a political get together? Is just just let's go shoot guns? And all, bring your- it's it's all those things. So uh, all the uh, proceeds will go to the Libertarian Party of Nebraska, mm-hmm. uh, and it is an opportunity for freedom lovers from around the area to come and hang out and have all sorts of fun. Uh, just to be clear, the first machine gun shoot happens uh, Friday afternoon. Okay, uh, and then the the second one happens Saturday morning, and then the main event happens later on in the day on Saturday. Uh, it is a thirty-five dollar vehicle entrance fee. Pack it with as many yep. people as you can, and we'll hang out. Vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party in twenty twenty. He was on most of your ballots. You didn't all get on. I was on all of they, them. They, the Libertarians got on all of them. I know it was Puerto Rico very and Guam. Controversial yeah. for a while. You saw the ticket of Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen on that ballot in twenty twenty, and uh, Spike is. Refusing to share with us uh, what his uh, future <laughs> political plans are, but uh, you're hanging out doing fundraisers for yes. uh, the Seward County Libertarian Party. He's hosting mm-hmm. you guys for an event this weekend. Yep. SpikeCohen.com. Click on events. Get all the details about Liberty Fest 2023. SpikeCohen.com. Here's the uh, question you always get. Spike, is this your given name? It was it was my great great grandfather's name. Yes, I'm actually Spike the Fifth. No spikes. No, uh, my given name is Jeremy. Uh, My older brother. What's the matter with Jeremy? My older brother convinced me that Jeremy was a girl's name. I was three when this happened. I was three. Just this entire story. Just keep in mind, I'm three. Uh, We went to see a movie. It had a character named Spike. I fell in love with it, and uh, I insisted on being Spike. My parents went with it. Figured it was a phase. I'm now forty. Yeah. What What movie would that have been? It was the My Little Pony movie. Again, (laughs) I am. Three. Uh, yeah. When this happens, I love it. I'm a toddler. Yes. Oh, well, you could have gone with you know rainbow or something. It like It could that. have been so, much worse. Yeah, right? it could have been. But this shows how libertarian I am. At the age of three, barely able to form you know my own sentences, I'm mm-hmm. saying. Well, I guess at three you can form sentences pretty well. I'm saying uh, I, I have a new name yeah. and I insist on being called that. And yes, you're stuck with it. Your brother Nancy Cohen <laughs> was. <laughs> Convinced you that Jeremy was a girl. Well, you said, you know, like Julie or Jenny. It's like it's a girl's name, and I'm. And it, it is very much not a girl's name. I'm gonna but get at three years old, I thought it was. Emails from Jeremy's right now. <laughs> to Scott no, Jeremy's a very masculine name. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, so Spike has just stuck. It's stuck. Like it. Thirty seven years. Uh, are people disappointed upon meeting you? Like, oh, Spike's coming by, and they figure a guy, oh, in a tough, like, yeah, leather yeah. clad. You know, he's got the studs on his fingerless gloves, he's got a like painted mohawk and all. You don't have any of that stuff. No, I, 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 I want to remain married. Um, I. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I do uh, shoot lots of machine guns, so I mean yeah. there is that. Yeah, if nothing that, else, that counts. Uh, <laughs> well, this is uh, you know I I'm asking you to be the voice of the Libertarian Party here yes. and address some of these things. Sure. Here, uh, we talked about some of the things that mostly conservative voters always say. Oh yeah, I like these guys. Yeah, I like yeah, this. Yeah. And then it's suddenly like women especially maybe moderates or swing voters say, yeah, I like what they're saying about fiscal responsibility and all that. But mm -hmm. uh, if we vote for the libertarians, everyone's going to have machine guns and cocaine. And I don't know if everyone needs to have, you know, they're going to be giving them out to third graders at my kid's school. Is that what, what's keeping you from, from doing cocaine and shooting machine guns is the, uh, the, the rules prohibiting such? Spike, nothing keeps me from <laughs> snorting cocaine and shooting machine guns. Well, there guns, you go. Then there's nothing uh, where you're going to the, – the status quo yeah. remains. No, I mean, listen. Here's the thing about the war on drugs. We already learned with prohibition of alcohol that when you prohibit a substance, not the bad actions that happen as the result of the use of that substance, but the substance itself, all you do is create a black market that enriches criminals by giving them an exclusive market to control themselves. They use that money to corrupt the local governments to look the other way. That corruption meanders its way into every other aspect of public life. Uh, the streets get less safe. Uh, all of the, you know, they think of the Valentine's Day massacre and all the things that happened during that. Crime goes through the roof. Violent crime goes through the roof. And all because the government decided they were going to tell you what you could or couldn't do with your body. We're watching that happen with drugs on a much bigger scale. Now, instead of it being Al Capone controlling Chicago, now it's cartels controlling entire sections of Latin America and, and surely parts of the United States as well. It doesn't work. And in the meantime, we still see people that are literally dying in the streets in record numbers of overdose. They are having no problem getting the things they need, but what they are able to do is get much safer and effective treatments to the chronic pain issues, the, the, the traumatic uh, uh, brain issues they're having and so forth that would be available if there weren't such heavy prohibitions on them. So instead they turn to street drugs and they end up dying. So this isn't working. It's, it, it isn't working. Uh, the bodily autonomy argument comes up and to the two of the hot button issues, not just in Nebraska, but across the country in this uh, legislative session have to do with transgender surgeries for youth and abortion. That was part of one bill with yeah. two heads on it that Nebraska just passed here recently. It's being fought in court right now. But yeah. does the bodily autonomy uh, also stretch to and if you want to have your you know, three year old have transgender surgery, uh, we can let that. And that is if they're born in the first place, because abortion up to eight months and three and a half weeks would be legal in a libertarian regime. Yeah. So uh, children cannot consent to things like that. Um, I, I hesitate to say I want government to get involved because I see how government being involved in something as simple as saying that parents can't abuse their children, how that gets weaponized with uh, medical kidnapping by CPS. So I, I really hesitate to give them yet another power, another weapon to use against parents. Uh, but with that said, just generally speaking, no, I don't, I don't think that children can consent to something like that. Uh, when it comes to abortion, I consider myself pro-life. Again, I can see how government getting involved makes it worse. Do you want government getting involved in making sure that your miscarriage was really a miscarriage uh, and, and, and putting in place licenses and the things that happen when you give it the power to regulate something? I, I don't. And I can actually see a scenario in which you create such a high barrier of cost to get a legal pregnancy that people start turning to illegal abortions because it's easier to hide an illegal abortion than an illegal, an illegal pregnancy. Fair conversation and good debate there when it comes to you know miscarriages, women's life is in danger, yep. medical necessity. In many instances, yep, yep, your yep. child's going to be you know born and, and live for a few minutes and all that. These are heartbreaking yep. discussions. They also make up, thankfully, a very small, a very small percentage portion, yep. of voluntary abortions yep. out there. And you say, do you want the government to get involved? Well, to a point, I don't like that. But you can make the same argument for murder. You know, yeah. that you want the government to get involved and say you can't shoot your neighbor in the face if he doesn't, you know, start weed whacking his lawn better and, you know, not blowing his uh, leaves over into your yard and all that stuff. So where do we draw that line as to what government can be involved in? So there are two differences between the the case of murder and the case of abortion. The big one is there is no consensus, even within the pro-life crowd or the pro-choice crowd, when personhood actually begins. Most people don't think it's at the very moment of conception that so now if, it's murder. So if we find that argument somewhere between conception right. and nine months, we find that, that sweet that spot. That magic moment yeah. of personhood. At that point, then what? 
at that point, now we have to ask about enforceability because, again, uh, it can be very easy to write it off as a miscarriage if you now have that prohibition in place, which means now the government says, OK, well, we need to make sure that every miscarriage is truly such. And then what ends up happening is whatever what always happens when conservatives think they get a victory, the progressives take over and go, oh, well, if we're uh, regulating pregnancies, then we should be making sure that, you know, uh, pregnant women's BMI is correct, that they're using the right supplements and the right uh, medicines, uh, that they're going to the doctors the right, you know, at, at the right periods of time. And here comes the cronies that, that step in and make sure that their their particular industry is protected. The cost goes up the roof. And then again, we have a situation where pregnancy becomes so prohibitively expensive to be done legally that because abortions never just went away, they just became illegal. You now have poor women getting abortions because they can't afford the penalties of of an illegal pregnancy. And it's easier to hide an abortion than a human being that you birth. The Libertarian Party doesn't generally get involved too much in some of these social issues, especially in a nation now, right, with, with a young groups of young people, a generation now of young people are addicted to staring at a, a device, uh, probably because they go try and talk to their parents and their parents are like, hey, get out of here. I'm watching Succession or whatever they're binge watching <laughs> that week. Um, and we've also got rampant mental health issues. Yep. Some of these kids have no idea what gender they are and somehow plural pronoun use has become acceptable. And so uh, it's 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 an inter- interesting time to be a teenager in 2023. And yes. I don't see the Libertarian Party like wanting to get involved in any of these social issues. Well, right? I mean, our, our take on most social issues is if you're an adult, you can do whatever you want as long as you're not imposing it on anyone else. So when it comes to this type of a situation, if you want to uh, go by some pronoun you just came up with yourself, then you certainly can. Uh, but you cannot force people to participate in that. If someone goes, uh, no, I've never heard that word before, so I'm not going to call you that. Uh, I, I, I think you're a guy, so I'm going to call you he. You can choose not to associate with that person, but you can't legislate or try to force them into doing it. You can say you don't like them and that you don't like what they're doing, and you can call them whatever name you want. But uh, I think most social issues, if you boil it down to individuals making choices, instead of it turning it into a political fight where one side has to win, and that means one side has to lose, then instead of everyone fighting over who's going to be forced to live the way of the other person, instead we just let people live their own lives. I know that's an insane concept uh, that you live differently than me and we allow each other to do so, uh, but I think that's the only way that we're going to fix it. The only truce we're ever going to have in this culture war is to say, you know what? You do your thing, I do my thing, we leave each other alone, and as long as you're not imposing yourself on me, I'm not going to impose myself on you. I I, I think that long term that's the only way to fix this. I love that idea. But I don't want other people to live the way they want to live because they don't know what they're doing. They're That's a so, good point. They're That's so point. bad at it. They're so bad uh, at doing, uh, being them. Spike Cohen with us here, libertarian <laughs> candidate for vice president in 2020. Yes. As far as the future, we'll find that out at a later date. Uh, Liberty Fest 2023 is coming up in uh, not not Gar- Garland, uh, yeah, Nebraska, Garland. just outside of Seward. Uh, this Friday, well, it's Saturday at 11 o'clock in the morning. Search Liberty Fest on Facebook. Go to SpikeCohen.com. Click on events. Um, While I have you in here for a few more minutes here, I want to continue to kind of flesh out what this libertarian utopia for America looks like. (laughs) What what does it look like when it, and then for law enforcement or the military yeah. in a libertarian utopia? Well, those are two explicitly different things. So I'll start with law enforcement. Uh, right now, we have a federalized and increasingly militarized law enforcement that is not doing what people actually want it to do. It's enforcing federal and state level diktat instead of actually protecting the communities as people want. You know, when someone says, hey, the next time uh, you want the, uh, the, the, the police to, uh, you know, uh, protect you from a murderer, call a crackhead. Look at the example they're giving, protecting you from a murder or stopping a rape or something like that. The majority of the work that police are being forced to do in order to get funding are things like civil asset forfeiture, where they're pulling people over, taking their property without trying them or even uh, or even charging them with a crime uh, because the federal government wants them to do that. They're pulling people over and arresting them for the possession of a plant that has medicinal purposes because the federal government wants them to do that. The majority of what policing is are things that the, the public doesn't actually want. So the answer to that well, is to will tell you that sometimes they pull someone over for a busted tail lighter because the smell of marijuana or whatever yeah. but these guys are involved in much more dangerous things and not we always use this and- as the opportunity 
to arrest them for these things and at least get them off the streets as we investigate their ties to other things. This well, happens. If, if someone is involved in something more dangerous, then that's fine. Then you can investigate and be involved in that. But that's not a reason to be ruining people's lives because of possession of a plant or giving someone a $250 fine because of a busted taillight, which for many people puts them back financially for weeks or months. So I, I, the answer to this is to get decentralized law enforcement so that decisions on what law enforcement looks like are be happening at the neighborhood and at the city level instead of happening in state capitals and on Capitol Hill. I don't care what Joe Biden thinks about what my policing in my community should look like. And I don't care what AOC or, or, or frankly, uh, you know, uh, anyone else that's in, in uh, Congress cares about it. I, I want to know I want to decide in my community with my neighbors what policing looks like. And that's going to be policing that we actually want. I think that's yeah. the best way to deal with that. And I, I hear you. I got – it was a big, pretty big publicized event here in Omaha just a few weeks ago. I got pulled over and police were giving me a hard time because I had uh, too much organic material in my trunk. Now, I was a dead prostitute. But <laughs> – it really, just looking at it, though, it was just organic material. Yes. And then, then, then they got to make a bad time for me. Yes. You know, so I, I hear you on the busting of people for having a plant. Yes. Uh, there, you know, never I'm mind. I'm not sure if that counts as a plant. Uh, Maybe no, as I, soil, but not as a plant. No, it's, it's, it's just organic material. It's at that point, yeah, yes. Yeah, at that point. But, yes. um, yeah, so I can see what that's Justice a problem. Justice for Scott, yeah. What, yeah. About, what about the military aspect of things? Yeah, so uh, the purpose of the military is to protect and defend the American people and the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. What the military has been used for is for domestic enemies to send them overseas to fight and kill and, and sometimes die on behalf of foreign dictators and drug cartels and to enrich the military industrial complex. And not only do we see the immediate effects of that, people coming home in flag draped caskets or coming home with PTSD or coming home with traumatic brain injuries or, or just the trauma of what they went through, but we also see inflation as a result of that. There's trillions of dollars being spent on, on a military that is not acting to protect us. It's acting to protect the status quo. The founders never intended such a thing. They intended that any martial force we have is here waiting for if something happens here, not going overseas and creating battles in order to protect the U.S. petrodollar relationship with Saudi Arabia or to protect a bunch of dictators or drug cartels. That's not what it's for. We should not be sending people overseas to protect poppy fields for heroin smugglers. So Spike Cohen's the president of the United States and Russia invades Ukraine. What do you do? What should America's stance be? I think our stance, if anything, if, if we are to be involved at all, is to try to negotiate a peace, uh, some kind of a peace between one of the largest nuclear powers on Earth and and it's and one of its neighbors. Um, the idea that NATO was going to stop this. Well, clearly, that's not the case, because it was actually, if anything, it was the fear of NATO expansion that that helped lead to what, frankly, was an unprovoked assault. Uh, on the Ukrainian people, but it was likely that the the uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this word. So the urination contest <laughs> between the U.S. and NATO powers and Russia and China and the, I guess the so-called BRICS countries yeah. uh, urination contest. Yeah. That's the nice I way to say. Appreciate it. that. It's a, <laughs> the polite it's way. Not to say. Yeah, it's, it's not a whizzing contest. It's not a whizzing contest. Urination. Yeah, it's contest, a urination yeah. festival. Um, but that <laughs> the the hap, that happening between them is leading to yeah. this con conflagration of of, uh, of of violence that we're seeing. In Ukraine and in other places. Um, but I think that the best way we could be involved is to negotiate. And we're in a good position to do so because we could tell Russia would love nothing more than access to Western markets, especially right now with all the sanctions. We could go to them right now and say, OK, listen, we want an end to this. We know you want access to Western markets. You want a normalization of relations. And we can sit down and come up with a verifiable step by step detente plan to do that. It starts with you leaving Ukraine. But that's not what we're doing. We're refusing to talk with them. We're saying instead we're going to send hundreds of billions of dollars more uh, in, in, in uh, aid and in weapons to a country that was listed as the most corrupt or one of the most corrupt in Europe uh, and saying that, you know, we're not going to have any accountability for the money that's going over there. And certainly this will lead to peace. It, it could very likely lead to an escalation of conflict with a nuclear power that that at least ostensibly feels as though it's it's sovereignty is at stake here. One other thing that libertarians uh, often get criticized for is mm -hmm. people say, well, if we vote for you, all of you guys, then suddenly, you know, the uh, the children, the education is going to be all torn apart. You know, the, the government spending for education is going to make our kids uh, schools uh, more of a bare bones approach to education. It's not going to be any good at all. Uh, and then, you know, health care is going to be 
in a bad uh, position there, like it's not already. Yeah. And what about my social security and, and all the rest of this stuff? Yeah. So all the easy Domestic stuff. Domestic spending. Yeah. yeah. So uh, education, uh, the federal government involvement has made it worse. It's cost trillions of dollars. And by every uh, available metric, education has gotten worse. And of course it did because the federal government is not a teacher. The federal government is an organization that has very explicit limitations to what it can do and what it should do. And education ain't one of them. Uh, education, frankly, shouldn't even be handled at the state level. That is another thing that parents and their teachers should be determining what schooling looks like, whether it's through a local public education system or whether it's through private education or whether it's through homeschooling. A good step down from that is school choice, allowing the money that's already being taken from you to be go, to, go to the school that you actually want it to go to. Um, in healthcare, same thing. The federal government getting involved in healthcare can be directly correlated to increases in the cost of healthcare. We use LASIK as an example, a counterexample of that. Get government out of it. Get the subsidies and the taxes and the regulations out of it. And you'd see healthcare go down so much in price and you would see a return to a price equilibrium because now it is uh, providers determining what patients can afford and patients determining what they want from those providers instead of the federal government creating a buffet system that's being paid for with debt that's going to be run up in the names of people that haven't even been born yet. Social security is a Ponzi scheme. It should have never been introduced, but thankfully there are plans that can scale us off and wean us off of Social Security while protecting the people that uh, already have their, their money that they get every month. The two main ones are the 6.2% solution, which was introduced by the Cato Institute about a decade or so back, which would allow people to uh, either opt out of the system and pay into their own account or to continue paying into the system. Uh, and if you decide to pay into your own account and get far higher yields, your your employer, their 6.2% goes into continuing to pay towards funding uh, Social Security. So that keeps it afloat. Another system, which I actually prefer, is called Plan for America. If you go to planforamerica.us, it is a contract-based system where a private entity would step in and completely take over the entire system with much higher yields and a much better return. And the only trade-off is that politicians can't rate it anymore. What don't you like to talk about? Because you, <laughs> you're enjoying all of this conversation. I'm enjoying having it with you. Like, what, what do you prefer not to talk about? What do you think is just useless pablum conversation? If people start talking about Hollywood or you know, Little League, I mean, what, what, what's your problem? What, what do you, what do you, like, what suddenly, like, people like, I like Spike. He's a good guy. And then you suddenly you start wandering off talking about, you know what I don't like? football you know yes. like whoa I mean, well i'm going to give a very political answer and right. say whatever uh, anyone talks about uh, is so important to them yeah, uh, that it matters to uh, me you're, too you're no, even I, doing the clinton thumb <laughs> i'm thing. even doing yeah. the thumb thing i wish i wish this were on video yeah. no um I, I will tell you this i anytime people start talking about celebrity hollywood stuff my eyes usually start to glaze over i just so you don't like you don't like music movies what do you what do you do for fun like oh, when I you're like, just when you're just hanging out in your sweatpants and not engaging in the debates of our time what do you uh, do so one of my favorite things to do is salsa dancing with my wife. We do. I'm actually. I know you can tell from looking at me that I am a very I, accomplished. Latin I met dancer. your wife earlier. I can see her salsa. <laughs> yes, you dancing. can see her salsa dancing. But I can't. I'm, the first I thing you did you. when you came in here is go. Oh, my back hurts. So I'm not. I seeing didn't say you. I did it well. No, I'm actually. A, I'm actually. No, I'm actually a pretty good. Uh, when my back is participating, mm -hmm. I'm actually. And I do that. I do a lot of. Uh, I, we live very close to the to the beach. Uh, I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Nice. I spend a lot of time at the beach, mm -hmm. uh, baking in the sun. Uh, that makes my wife happy because she continues to continue to look younger than me yes. because I'm just, you know, aging in front of everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, I, I do a lot of this stuff, so I enjoy doing that as well. Uh, yeah, if I had to pick something I, I'm not a huge fan of, it's just talking about the celebrity stuff. But yeah. if that's mm -hmm. important to you, then, you know, Godspeed. All right. Uh, let's see here. See, this is this is exactly what I started off the hour talking about, Spike. I get an email here from Jim. It says, I like this guy. I can't vote for him because I want someone who can win. <laughs> <laughs> he says, we need Biden and Democrats out. I'll vote for anyone who can do that. That's from Jim. I agree with the second part of that. You get uh, one minute here to kind of wrap up and invite people out this weekend to fire off machine guns. Sure, absolutely. Come shoot machine guns with me in Garland, Nebraska, which I'm told is between Seward and Lincoln. That's right. Uh, You'll you, find it. If yeah. you go to uh, SpikeCohen.com, you can find out all 
the particulars of how to get there. We're going to have a lot of fun starting uh, Friday afternoon, I think at 3 p.m., and uh, and then Saturday morning and all through Saturday. We're going to be talking about all sorts of fun liberty and freedom stuff. We're going to have food. We're going to have music. We're going to have all sorts of fun stuff. And, again, we're, I, I know I, I, I begin and end with what I think is the the uh, the lead, which is we're going to be shooting machine guns. So yeah. uh, come hang out with us. We're going to have a really fun time. And uh, What are you uh, shooting machine guns at? Well, at Targets. Yeah, yeah <laughs> not the department store. I know there's no, no, been a no, no, social no. issue there this week. but Oh, yeah, no, I guess I should clarify. Yeah. We're going to be shooting. <laughs> I'm used to talking to libertarians. We're going to be shooting <laughs> machine guns at inert uh-huh. uh, objects that uh, pose uh, no threat uh, to Good. us, and we pose no threat to anyone else. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> SpikeCohen.com. You can learn more about the event in Garland, Nebraska, this Saturday. It just says Saturday right now, but you're also firing off uh, machine guns Yeah, it should Friday, say Friday but, and Saturday. Yeah, you know, it's, it actually starts on Friday. I'm it's, on the Facebook page. So go to SpikeCohen.com. Spike, really great talking to you, and I look forward to doing it again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on.